So over the course of a calendar year, Moses, Moshe, has been going to Paro, Pharaoh, and warning him about various plagues. And each time Moshe correctly and exactly predicts what's going to happen. And now Moshe comes to Pharaoh with the final warning. This time, it's the big one. Moshe tells Pharaoh, tonight around midnight, every firstborn son in Egypt, including that of Pharaoh, is going to die. And sure enough, the Torah tells us that that night at midnight, God himself killed all of the firstborns in Egypt. And Pharaoh, we're told by the passage, woke up at night. And he went searching for Moshe and for Aaron, Aaron, to tell them, leave, take your people, and go. Now, on the passage describing Pharaoh waking up at night, Rashi, the greatest of the biblical commentators, has a brief comment. He tells us that Pharaoh woke up, quote, from his bed. Now, Rashi only comments, typically, if there's something that we wouldn't have figured out by ourselves or to teach us a deeper lesson. I think that even without Rashi's comment, we probably would have figured out that when the Torah tells us that Pharaoh woke up, he woke up from his bed. Where else would he have been? The royal hammock? The royal couch? I don't think we need Rashi's comment to teach us that Pharaoh was in his bed. So what's the deeper lesson Rashi's trying to send or teach? This may be what's going on. Rashi wants to make sure that we realize, after all of these correct predictions of plagues by Moshe, nine prior plagues visited by God on Pharaoh and the Egyptians, and now a warning about the tenth that includes a warning that not only all the firstborn sons, but Pharaoh's firstborn son as well is going to die. And Pharaoh himself, we're told, was a firstborn. That Pharaoh, that night, puts his pajamas on and gets into bed and goes to sleep. Can you imagine that? Now, I get it. I understand he's wicked. He's evil. He's a scoundrel. He will not recognize God. God is hardening his heart. But still, wouldn't you think that that night of all nights, he would have stayed up late, maybe with his firstborn son, at least until midnight, on the off chance that something's going to happen? But no, not Pharaoh. He puts his blinders on, gets into his PJs, and gets into bed because he's fooling himself, and he ends up undone. He ends up on the wrong side of God's wrath. And of course, we do the same thing to different degrees. We put on our pajamas or boxer shorts or nightgowns and we get into our cozy, snug, comfy beds and we fool ourselves. We want God to be around during difficult times, trials, tribulations, illnesses, surgeries. But we really don't want him around looking over our shoulder when times are going well because that would be inconvenient. We don't want to have to be called to account and be responsible for our actions. We'd rather that he's not around when we're doing things that he, we shouldn't be doing or when we're not doing things that we should be doing. But the amazing thing here is that the story's not over because our sages tell us that later when the Jews left Egypt and they crossed the sea that God parted miraculously for them and then the sea came back and engulfed and killed all the Egyptians, it didn't kill all of the Egyptians. One of them survived, Pharaoh. God let him live as a living testament of what happens when you war, when you trifle, when you take on God. And sure enough, wouldn't you know, Pharaoh later becomes the king of the great city of Nineveh. And when the prophet Jonah, Yonah, comes with this prophecy that Nineveh is going to be destroyed by God unless its inhabitants repent, Pharaoh himself, the king of Nineveh, tells his people, you've got to repent. Don't take on God. I've been there. I've done that. It did not end well. A message again for all of us. As badly as we've been fooling ourselves, and as far away as we've been, and as alienated as we've been, it's never too late to stop fooling yourself and to come back.